Accessing health information is the third highest search that Canadians do. Everyone is looking for health information, but if you go look for information on concussions, you'll get millions and millions of hits. So how do you know what's the most credible evidence-based information? And that was one of the reasons why we wanted to collate all the information and develop the concussion awareness training tool or the CAT so they can go to it to get the information. That's Dr. Shalina Babul, one of the world's leading experts on concussion awareness and prevention and creator of the CAT, the Concussion Awareness Training Tool. She's our guest on this episode of Concussion Central, the podcast that changes the way you get your information about concussions. Hi, and welcome to Concussion Central. I'm your host, David McGuffin. Our aim on this podcast is to help you, the listener, navigate the often very confusing world of concussions, diagnosis, treatment, and more. And we understand that for those living with a concussion, the best way to receive that information isn't by reading or on a screen. It's by listening. We hear you. On this podcast, we'll be bringing you regular audio interviews with some of the world's leading experts on the many aspects of concussions. And today, we're thrilled to welcome Dr. Sholina Babul. She's an Associate Director and Sports Injury Specialist with the British Columbia Injury Research and Prevention Unit at BC Children's Hospital. And she's the creator of the Concussion Awareness Training Tool, catonline.com. The CAT is arguably the most authoritative concussion training tool available, providing free online accredited courses for medical professionals and training courses for coaches, athletes, teachers, parents, employers, workers, and more. So, Dr. Shalina Babul, welcome to the Concussion Central podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you here. And uh, before we get into the CAT and what you've developed with that, I- I'd love to know what was your background in the world of concussions and what brought you to concussion knowledge training? Was there a moment? Yeah. So my, I did a PhD in hyperbaric medicine, uh, Mm -hmm. specific to sports and sports medicine. Um, and my interest, uh, evolved, you know, the brain is such an intricate and delicate organ. It's the only organ that you can't transplant. And it's really your information highway for walking, Mm -hmm. talking, eating, hearing. Uh, and it was probably in the late, uh, two thousands with the death of Natasha Richardson that, um, you know, piqued my interest and really piqued the interest of the media and medicine. Can you remind people of what happened there? Sure. Yeah. Natasha uh, Richardson, the actress Natasha Richardson, was taking a, a beginner lesson at Mont Tremblant, uh, took a seamlessly minor fall, you know, got up, said she wasn't, she was feeling a bit off, and she actually skied herself back to her chalet, uh, had a progressively worsening headache, was medevaced to hospital, and died two days later uh, from a subdural hematoma or a bleed to the brain. Um, Now, in my mind, should she have been wearing a helmet, she would probably be alive today. In saying that, there's no such thing as a concussion-proof helmet. If you think about the mechanics of a concussion and what happens to the brain, the bouncing around of the brain inside the skull, there's no preventive equipment that will stop that, but it will Mm -hmm. certainly mitigate the severity of the injury by absorbing the energy on impact. So that really piqued my interest. Actually, it started just before that. And then that really solidified my interest in really understanding the brain and the intricacies of the brain. And that's when I delved into this area further. And then it wasn't until really, arguably, the world's best hockey player, Sidney Crosby, sustains a multiple concussions over a short period of time and is sidelined indefinitely at that time, which ended up being 10, 11 months. That got people really interested to know what's happening here. You've got the the world's best hockey player who's not playing the game he loves, scores the winning goal at the 2010 Winter Olympics. What's going on here? And that was really around 2000, between 2008, 2010 was when I really dove into really understanding what happens to the brain during a concussion and what we can do to help British Columbians and Canadians uh, really recognize and understand what they need to do specific to this injury. And you've developed the concussion awareness training tool, which I, I which I've done, and I encourage everyone listening to go check it out. I uh, I did sort of the there's different sections you can go into and mm-hmm. do different trainings. I did the parental training, and it's very clear. It's it's very easy to do. You just click your way through it. So I absolutely encourage people to check that out. 
But what, what was it? And this developed not long after this, around the Sidney Crosby mm -hmm. brain injury, I'm thinking. So what was it that brought that about? And what was the, the story behind that? Yeah, so I started getting calls in my office from um, parents saying, you know, what do I do? The doctor said he just had his bell rung. He'll be fine in a couple of days. Or where do I go for information? Like there's so much on the internet. Or the teacher doesn't believe him or her that she can't study for her test. He, he You know, they think she's just trying to get out of it. So I recognized there was a real disconnect connect and what people understood specific to this injury. So what I did then was I did an environmental scan, a national and an international environmental scan to say, what exists in terms of educating various audiences? Because concussions affect everybody, not just the individual who's going through it. Everybody's involved. It's a community collective um, recovery process. So physicians need to know how to accurately diagnose concussions and manage it based on the current best practices. Parents know how to manage and help and support their child. Teachers know how, need to know how to support their students. So I did a, a scan to say, what exists? Does anything exist to, to really educate these audiences? And nothing did. There was um, a couple that existed at the time, but there was a cost associated with it. And our provincial government said, if we want British Columbians to really learn about this injury, we're not going to charge them. We want them to have something readily available to them. And then what I did was I conducted focus groups with all these audiences to say, if we build something for you, mm -hmm. what do you want? Uh, physician said, we want the most amount of information, up-to-date information in the least amount of time because we don't have time. Um, and we have to be up to speed on all the injuries and in illnesses. Parents said, you know, I want to know a one-stop shop where I can go to get this information. Teacher said, I want to know how to support my students. Give us something for that. Um, and based on all this feedback, we then built the concussion awareness training tool or the CAT. And um, just to add to that, when we built it, we initially built it uh, with having British Columbia in mind. And then mm -hmm. we recognized that how we recognize, treat, and manage concussions in British Columbia should be no different than Canada or internationally for that matter. So we framed it as a global uh, tool to educate everyone and anyone who is interested. So can you just des describe the website itself and, and how it works just for people out there who might be interested? Yeah. So depending on what lens you bring to it, uh, you go to the main page and on the main page, there's icons right at the top. So whether you're a physician or a teacher or um, a high performance athlete, uh, someone who's in the workforce, workers or workplaces, someone, women support workers who deal with intimate partner violence, um, you can click on that button. And that will take you to a page specific to you. On the main page, you've also got highlights, which are the latest news uh, and just uh, key social media uh, blasts that have been posted. Mm -hmm. But when you go to your specific page, there's an e-learning course for you uh, and then relevant information that's specific to you or your patients or you as a parent uh, or, again, whichever lens you bring to it. And each e-learning course is roughly about, I would say, 40 minutes to an hour, depending on which one you go to, but you can spend more or less time as you like, and you can, uh, you can take it at your own pace. So one of the, one of the highlights physicians said to us was we want to take it, but if we take it in between seeing patients, we want to leave it and come back to it and not have to redo it right. so they can pick it up where they left off. So it contains all the necessary information, the up-to-date, necessary, evidence-based best practices around concussion. And it's free of charge. It's updated monthly because the science around this injury is evolving rapidly. So we want it to be updated. Um, we check for broken links because, as you know, I, I, I know when I go to a website and if something's not working, I, chances are I'll never go back there again. Um, so we, we ensure that everything is functional, everything is working, and that it is up-to-date. Yeah, and it is very easy to use, very user friendly, um, and it's being used now around the world. Rick, is that what you're finding? It is. We get about fifty five hundred to six thousand hits a day wow. uh, to the website. We have over ninety thousand course completions uh, because you get a certificate upon completion. Physicians get CME credits for taking it, mm -hmm. um, and it's being used globally. Um, so you know, over seventy five uh, organizations, schools, associations have mandated it. And um, we've had, uh, you know, 
medical schools in Japan uh, using it. We we've taken it to East Africa, Uganda, Nairobi, and Tanzania are using it for their medical staff there. And we've got something in the works to train the physicians and nurses in Lebanon next year, hmm. uh, and in discussion with Australia and New Zealand as well. So it's being used worldwide, and we're very pleased with that. That's fantastic. And what I love too is just that it touches all these different groups. And you mentioned earlier, I mean, it. it it affects a lot of people with concussion, mm -hmm. not just the, the person mm -hmm. who's suffering through it. And I mean, it really, it takes a village, I guess you could almost say yeah. to, to solve it. If there's one thing we've learned in this podcast so far, it really involves all these different disciplines and they need to be working together to, to help you get over it. I was interested to see that this is part of a, a larger, what's called the Concussion Harmonization Project. And could you tell us a bit about what that is? Yeah, you know, for the longest time, everybody was doing work in silos. And how we treat and manage concussions, as I said, in BC should be no different than how my colleagues do it in Ontario. So we really formed a, a, an alliance, if you will, to work collectively. So not to, you know, if we have a fact sheet that we've developed, why not use that fact sheet, say, in Ontario um, mm -hmm. as well? Um, and collectively, you know, you can brand it yourself and whatnot. Um, so we've uh, partnered with Parachute, which is the National Injury Prevention Organization um, based out of Ontario, but it's national in scope, and uh, as well as partnering with the Public Health Agency of Canada. So it really harmonizes the work that everyone is doing across the country. Uh, there is a concussion expert advisory group that's been formed, and we all really work to not reinvent the wheel, but really educate and utilize the collective resources to be more efficient and to get the message across to Canadians. So where do you see the concussion knowledge or information gaps now? Like what, what gaps still need to be bridged here? So we've come a long way in the last decade to really recognize that a concussion is not just having your bell rung, it's a brain injury and needs to be immediately recognized. In saying that, we have a long way to go to really understanding the brain and the intricacies of the brain. Why, uh, you know, you can have one individual who takes a significant head-to-head -head hit, say, heading the ball in soccer, mm -hmm. is, is completely fine the next day, versus someone who's taking the groceries out of the trunk of their car, hits their head on the trunk, and is out for months on end. So what is it about the brain that causes such a, uh, a vast discrepancy in the recovery process? So we do need to really further understand what's happening to the brain. But in terms of recognition, where we were a decade ago to now, uh, we've come a long way. People are recognizing it uh, uh, as they weren't before and playing through it and toughing it out. Or, you know, if you're feeling off, they, you know, didn't pay attention to it. And we see that in hospitalizations, uh, in emergency department visits, the numbers have gone high uh, or gone up. Um, and that's not necessarily because there's more happening. It's, it's, you know, probably indicative of more awareness and education that's happening across our country. What's the potential impact of these gaps on concussion patients themselves? You know, if you sustain a concussion and you don't recognize it and you continue to participate in activity or continue to go on with your daily day-to-day -day routines, you are three times more likely to sustain a second concussion, potentially more severe in nature and prolonging your recovery. Now, again, if that isn't recognized and you continue to play, say, in sports, you're now nine times more likely to sustain significant brain damage and possibly even death. And unfortunately, in Ontario, we had a case of that with the death of Rowan Stringer many mm -hmm. years back because it wasn't recognized by herself or she didn't tell anyone about it or her you know, coach. And she continued to participate playing in rugby, not knowing the implications of doing so. So it's really important to, for Canadians to really recognize what a concussion is, what they may be feeling, and know how to respond to it immediately, which is, uh, you know, 48 hours of immediate cognitive and physical rest to let your brain heal from the impact, the initial impact. I was interested in one of your recent journal articles that talked about how concussion patients find information online and what, what is it that you discovered? What, what are they finding out there? Yeah. So in terms of um, accessing health information, 94% of uh, Canadians and 87% of Americans have the internet and accessing health information is the third highest search 
that Canadians do. So everyone is looking for health information. But again, if you go look for information on concussions, you'll get millions and millions of hits. So how do you know what's the most credible evidence-based information? And that was one of the reasons why we wanted to collate all the information and develop the concussion awareness training tool or the CAT so they can go to it to get the information. Now, in saying that, social media is another platform that's mm-hmm. being used heavily. And the and the CAT has um, Facebook uh, and Twitter presence as well. And people access Twitter uh, and social media to get up-to-date evidence. But for all the positive things that social media has, there's also negative things because people put out information based on opinions, not based on evidence. Um, So there's good and bad. But, you know, we found that um, a lot of students who sustained a concussion, particularly in university, use, use the social media platform to talk to others who went through a similar process and what they did to get through it. And they found that really supportive and helpful to hear other people's stories, to know that they're not the only ones going through this. Concussions are an invisible injury. You can't overtly see it like a casted broken foot or a hand. So knowing, you know, how other people responded, what Mm -hmm. they did, what was helpful, uh, was proven to be really effective for these university students. Just gives a sense of community or a sense of support. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. When you're advising people on where to, I mean, obviously you guys have your own website, which is hugely helpful, but when you're advising people on what to look for and how to look for it, I mean, what what advice Mm -hmm. do you have both, both on the web and social media, I guess? Yeah, to ensure what you're reading and what you what information that you're gathering is evidence based. Mm. It's you know it's not a, a someone voicing an opinion or a blog. Ensure that it is a reputable journal or you know uh, you know WebMD. Uh, you know we all know how repu- reputable WebMD mm-hmm. is. Um, so you can you rest assured that information on WebMD is credible and reliable and evidence based versus say you know Joe's Medical Science dot com which, you know, I, you know, just making yeah. up that name, but, you know, I wouldn't rely on something like that. Yeah. I mean, something that has editors is being vetted, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. Everything is peer reviewed when it's evidence based. Yeah. And all that information should be somewhere on that website saying, this is how we get to where we are. Usually. In Absolutely. The event, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's why on the concussion awareness training tool, everything that we put on there is um, evidence-based. Again, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel because we know there's a lot of credible resources out there. So we just put it all in in a one-stop shop, which was the feedback we got from the focus groups. Fantastic. And just wondering what what new things are. are you saying we're getting new evidence all the time and that's so what, what, what new things are you working on now in the concussion field that have you excited? Yeah. So, you know, um, we know that artificial intelligence, virtual reality seems mm. to be really in the forefront of medicine. So what we're doing right now, we're in, engaged in a project looking at training uh, police officers when they go into the homes of victims of domestic violence. So a lot of times when officers go into the setting, they, they don't recognize that um, concussions are probably highly um, a concern when you walk mm-hmm. in from the j- jarring and the shaking of the victim and the bouncing of, of the, the acceleration, deceleration of the yeah. head. Um, so what we're doing is we're developing uh, Google glasses um, to train them ahead of time vir- through virtual reality mm. on how to respond to uh, at-home domestic violence situations. So it's very exciting to to be able to train police officers using, you know, Google glasses. Can you explain how that works? That sounds fascinating. Yeah. So it creates a scenario uh, when you wear the virtual reality head, you know, headset, it creates a setting where they actually walk into the home and you're given different scenarios of when you walk in and teach them how to respond, what questions to to ask the the victim um, or the perpetrator if, if they're around uh, and what they need to do to respond to that situation. Do they need to uh, send the victim to for an assessment um, at a healthcare uh, facility or the hospital? Um, and and how they need to report those findings. So it's currently in its beta testing, uh, but we're very excited to see how how this will play out when we start training the police officers in Vancouver. That's really fantastic. Um, and in terms, I mean, you've, you've described the huge changes that have happened just even in the last decade. I mean, what mm-hmm. what changes do you hope to see still to come? 
Yeah, like I said, we've, you know, we've um, come a long way, but we have a long way to go. We really need to understand the in intricacies of the mm -hmm. brain. What's happening? Is it a certain fulcrum? Is it a certain point of the brain that gets triggered? Um, is it the number of subconcussive blows? Um, we've got incredible colleagues doing work in neuroimaging, um, looking at blood biomarkers, you know, there's no diagnostic tool to diagnose a concussion currently. It's purely based on doing a detailed assessment, looking at clinical history um, of concussions, doing some balance memory assessments, and then making a, a diagnosis. But there's no blood test, there's no X-ray. Typically conventional imaging X-rays and CT scans won't show mm -hmm. you that you have a concussion. Because unless you have a bleed to the brain or a skull fracture, conventional imaging won't show you anything. Higher resolution imaging, fun functional, um, functional MRI or diffuse tensor imaging does seem to show changes to the brain, but that's not feasible at the emergency department setting because those are very costly. Uh, neuroimaging techniques. So we're hoping to, to you know, see some sort of, you know, will we be able to have a, a blood test, a, a pin, a, a prick to the finger that will conclusively assess a, a, and diagnose a concussion? Will we have more concrete assessments for concussion? Um, and then we, you know, what we'll have a better understanding on, you know, for instance, chronic traumatic encephalopathy mm -hmm. or CTE in all these deceased players. Unfortunately, CTE is only diagnosed uh, postmortem. Can we see an increase in tau pro proteins while the individual is alive? Why is it happening in you know, 90% of the autopsies and not in 10%. So again, we need to really understand what's happening to the brain, where in the brain, you know, is there a certain point that triggers the tau protein? Um, so we're hoping over the next decade, we'll get some answer to these questions. Fascinating. I mean, you talk about a blood test. I mean, is that something that there's like real science behind and that could happen? It's currently being developed. Um, they are seeing a blood test to diagnose more severe brain injury. So changes in protein to, to mark severe brain injuries, but they haven't found it yet for, for minor or mild traumatic brain injuries like a concussion. So, you know, perhaps in the next decade, we'll get something more concrete. You know, can we do a litmus test? Um, you know, anything like that to, to, you know, make it easier for the physician to diagnose a concussion. The other issue is that to do a comprehensive uh, exam to diagnose a concussion, you probably need about 45 mm. minutes, 35, 45 minutes. And physicians don't have that time in office. You know, they have five to 10 minutes with the patients, if mm -hmm. that. So we need to find more viable options to diagnose a concussion for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it goes back to your point about everyone needing to understand what the symptoms are and like, from the school nurse to the parents, to the coach, to the... Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's my area. I mean, we've got, like I said, we've got incredible work being done, but from bench to bedside, we know that takes 15 to 30 years. But at the ground level for Canadians now, they need to understand that one, concussions are a brain injury, two, what they may be feeling, and three, that you need to, you need to know what to do to recover from this injury. Another very important point I'd like to make is that signs and symptoms may not appear immediately. So a lot of times someone will take a hit, say playing hockey, they'll come off, the coach will ask them a few questions, they'll put them back in. That's not necessarily the right thing to do because signs and symptoms can appear subtly after uh, up to 48 yeah. hours. So we always say err on the side of caution if you suspect a concussion or there was a significant in hit that caused the acceleration, deceleration, rotation of the brain keep that individual off for two days. Would you rather be off for two days or two months? You decide. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, thank you so much for your time. This has been such a fascinating discussion. And remind people where they can find the cat. The cat, uh, the website is cattonline.com. It's available in Eng English and French, and it's free of charge. And as I said, it's updated regularly. Um, and it contains all the information you need specific to concussions. Um, we've just added information for the visually impaired as well. Uh, and we've also been working with the film industry, stunt performers who uh, take, you know, repeated blows or fake blows to the head, which I hadn't, I hadn't even considered that area. So um, there's a lot of information on the cat. So I encourage you to go in and visit it. I do too. Thank you so much again for coming on the Concussion Central podcast. My pleasure. Thank you so much, David. And thank you for listening. If you enjoy Concussion Central, please do us a big favor and give us a five-star rating and write us a glowing review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. I know it's a bold ask, but the way the algorithm works, it's the best way for these interviews to reach as wide an audience as possible. 
And remember to subscribe so you catch all of our future episodes. For more information on the work of Concussion Central, you can visit us at concussioncentral.ca. Until next time, I'm David McGuffin.